uh, four lines from the bottom on 822. So the first thing it says is that you got this battle, and you got these two men named Dosa and Vaviram. Move this chair away. You got these two men, thank you. Two men named Dosa and Vaviram. Now Dosa and Vaviram would be a thorn in the side of Moshe Rabbeinu all along, if you remember, since he came out of Egypt. And uh, um, it does sort of actually serve a very important purpose for Moshe Rabbeinu. Because anytime you've got a severe critic, when you've got harsh critics and people who are gunning for you, and they're silent, that means you're doing okay. Right? So sometimes in life it's good to have, it's good to have harsh critics. Because the harsh critics, if the harsh critics are not being critical of you, that means you must be doing okay because they're the first guys who are going to jump on you. So Dustin and Aviram ironically serve as when, they, when they're fetching, and they, they, they've been fetching all along. They're the guys when Moshe Rabbeinu broke up the fight in Egypt, they snitched on him. And then Dustin and Aviram were the ones who, who didn't obey the law with the mun, and the mun that they gathered ended up rotting. Every time Moshe Rabbeinu wants, there's the, every time there's been trouble, Dustin and Aviram have been there. And the fact that most of them, now that they're not fetching means that they're, that they're silenced. Here they join the battle. So Moshe Rabbeinu tries, a peaceful, tries the peaceful approach. Vayishlach Moshe, four lines from the bottom on 822. Vayishlach Moshe, Vayishlach Moshe, Vayikro ledosan v'la aviram b'nei aliyav, Vayomru lo na'ale. They said, we're not coming up. Now, we're not coming up has a double layer meaning. Meaning, lo na'ale, you're probably trying to contact us and you're going to offer us a position as a bribe. You're going to try to bribe us by giving us a position, like they do with politicians. I'll give you a position and you'll join our coalition and that, that sort of thing. And they say to him, lo na'ale, don't even try it. Don't even try it. There's prophetic words. There's sometimes what we call a prophecy without even knowing it because they say, we're not going up. Because in the end, what happens to them? They go down. Right? They get they get swallowed up. So there's a there's sometimes you your your own mouth your own mouth trips you up. Hamaat, <laughs> it's not enough. Ki elisanu me eret zavas cholov udvash la misenu ba midbor. It's not enough that you brought us out of a land of milk and honey to kill us in the desert. Which is the land of milk and honey that they're referring to? Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim. Oh, it's just so wonderful. Mitzrayim was just just uh, just they were happy as a lark in Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim, they're getting beaten up and slaves. All of a sudden, short term memory, Jewish short term memory. It's not enough you took us out of that wonderful land. And one of the reasons they bring up the words Zavas Chalavudvash is because Eretz Yisrael was called Zavas Chalavudvash. And they're just reminding the people of the decree of 40 years that took place with the, with, with the Baragda. In other words, this is a, this is a very, very uh, underhanded way of bringing up a reminder of exactly what we are suffering from. We're suffering to get the people all riled up. Kisi Starer, Aleinu Gami Starer. We're not, we're not, what do you call it? You're, you're just lording, you're lording yourself over us. Ha'ene, aflo alert zavas chalavudvash aviyasanu, you did not bring us to the land of chalavudvash, vatitan lanu nachla sada vakarim, giving us fields and vineyards. Ha'ene ha'anashi mahim tenaker, what you're gonna, you're gonna poke out our eyes, lo nala, we're not coming up. The, 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 the Torah itself, when it talks about bribes, it says bribes blind. A bribery blinds a person. Because when you're bribed, the word shochad, which is bribes, is, has the word chad in it. Chad means one. When you bribe somebody, you become one with him. In other words, that person who's been bribed loses his objectivity. So they're telling Moshe Rabbeinu, you're trying to bribe us, obviously, which was not Moshe Rabbeinu's intent. So you're trying to bribe us. You're not going to poke out our eyes. You're not going to blind us with this bribery. Lo na'ale. We're not willing to come up to you in order to, to, to take the position that you want to want to bribe us with. Now, at that point, Moshe Rabbeinu loses it. Now, listen to what he says. Vayichar Moshe 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 gets very upset. Vayomer al Hashem. He says a prayer. Al tefen al min Do not, uh, uh, how's he trained? Do not turn to their offering. In other words, don't accept their offering. This is a very, very weird way to go into this a little bit. I have not taken one donkey. I've not taken one donkey from the... And I've not harmed any of them. What does Moshe Rabbeinu mean by that? So take a look at Rashi. It's the right column of Rashi, five lines, six, five lines from the bottom. 
I never took one donkey. In other words, I never misused my position to take any benefits because of my position. Even when I went from Midian to Egypt to serve these people, I couldn't take it. I had the rights to take the donkey from them. I had the rights to, 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 to have my expenses paid by the people. I took my own donkey. I never even used the expenses of the people. I paid for all the expenses out of my own pocket. I never used my position whatsoever in order to what he, now, the, what's question, the question over here is, I just trouble you, uh, George, I told you to make it a little colder. The, uh, the question here is that Moshe Rabbeinu is obviously trying to say what his, what his stature is. He's saying to God, listen, God, I don't want you to listen to them and just realize who I am. He's not boasting over here. He's not <laughs> boasting over here. He's just trying to say, look, we're just trying to compare who am, who am I compared to who they are. Right? Now, if you were Moshe Rabbeinu, what would you say to God if you wanted to emphasize your stature? What would you say? Hashem talks to him face to face. I've been spoken to, and I cross, I, what do you call it, I, I split the sea, and I was up on Har Sinai, and I brought the Torah. I, there's a lot of things I would think of on the list before I mentioned not taking donkeys from people. You know, there, there, there's a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of, what do you call it, a lot of things that Moshe Rabbeinu could have resorted to before he got the donkeys. So it's a very, very important concept here. It's so, it's so important. Uh, it can't be overemphasized. It starts with the Gemara. The Gemara says like this. The Romans at one point made a decree that no one is, the Jewish people are not allowed to teach Torah. So there's a man named Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion, who we read about both on Yom Kippur and in Tisha B'Av when we talk about the ten martyrs who were put to death by the Romans. Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion was the one who they wrapped up in a Sefer Torah and burnt him alive. So Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion, in open, blatant defiance of the Romans, he went and he started teaching Torah in public. Not only he was studying Torah, he was teaching Torah in public. The Romans had said no Torah at all. Uh, take home you guys, we're on page 824. He said, there, there's a, the, 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 in, in, in open defiance of the Romans, Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion went and he, and he started teaching Torah in public. He met Rav Yossi ben Kisma. Rav Yossi ben Kisma we find in Pirkei I have to make a bracha because I went outside the building. Means if you make a bracha, you can stay on your bracha as long as you're inside one building. But I had to go out of the building, so I lose my bracha. Rav Yossi ben Kisma said to Rabbi Chanina ben Teradion, I hear that you've been teaching Torah in public in open defiance of the Romans. I'd be surprised if they don't end up burning you with that Sefer Torah together. So Rabbi Yossi ben Rechenina ben Teradi said, well, what is my station going to be in the world to come? So Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma said, well, give me an example of something that you've done. So Rabbi Yossi ben Teradi said, well, I once set aside money for my Purim feast. You know, on Purim we have a Suda. You make a feast on Purim, it's a mitzvah. I set aside some money for my Purim feast, and I got mixed up, and I ended up giving that money away to tzedakah. And I didn't reimburse myself from charity, I just took other money and made, made the feast with that. When Rabbi Yosef and Kisma heard that, he said to Rabbi Chinevada, well, I hope my station in the world to come is with you. That means you're going to be in a pretty good place. So the commentaries ask in the Gemara, I understand, if I was Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion, and I'd say to Rabbi Yosef, can you tell me what's my, what's my level going to be? What's my rank going to be in the world to come? Yeah, well, tell me, give me an example of something you did. I would have said, I taught Torah against the Roman decree. I, I was at great personal self-sacrifice. I taught Torah so much so that it's going to end up getting me killed. That's what I use as an example. Giving away money to tzedakah, not reimbursing yourself the 50 bucks that you, that you gave is a very nice thing. But if it's, if it's 50 bucks versus teaching Torah because the Romans have decreed not to, which one seems to be a little bit more prominent? It's, it's teaching Torah seems to be more prominent. So why, so why would Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma, and then Rabbi, why would, that's what Rabbi Chanina ben Teradin gives an example, and that's what Rabbi Yossi ben Chanina says, oh, wow, I'm jealous. I, I, hope, I hope my rank is like your rank in the world to come. Why do you use that as an example? So Rabbi Dessler, he says over here a very important principle. 
Every mitzvah that a person does, we know that we get rewarded, no matter what the mitzvah is. Sometimes you can do a big one. You know, sometimes the guy's drowning and you dive into the water and you save him, and sometimes, what do you call it, you have a you, very, very, very dramatic moments in life. You get rewarded for that, no question about that. That's not your level, though. That's not who you are. In other words, in the world to come, there seems to be reward and there seems to be a level where you get rewarded. I don't know, the, I don't know exactly where we draw these lines. These are already things that are beyond our comprehension. But what Reb Dessler explains is that your eternal level is not determined by dramatic things that you do. And this is a big mistake people make. Your eternal level is determined by the little things that you do consistently. That means, yes, he split the sea. Yes, he brought down the Torah. Yes, but who are you as a person? Who is the, who are you? As, I'm the person who didn't take, doesn't take donkeys from people. It's the day, hold for a few minutes. It's a donkey, it's the day-to-day -day small actions that define us. That's one of the mistakes we often make, is we want to become tzaddikim. I want to be a tzaddik, right? See, yeah, yeah, I may help a little old lady carry her bags on a, on a hot day, right? But then, you know, uh, you may uh, cut ahead of somebody in line in the lunchroom, or uh, you may wake up your roommate when you walk in at night, or, you know, the little things, uh, and certainly within families, uh, where you have a spouse or parents or siblings, and that's where the best of us comes out, uh, <laughs> they, 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 sometimes, uh, <laughs> most times not. And that's who you really are. That's who you really are. So Moshe Rabbeinu, when this, and, and, and that's what Rabbi Hanina ben Taradian was responding. He understood Rabbi Yosef Kiswa's question. He's saying, give me an example. You want to know your station in the world to come? What your rank is in the world to come? I need a definition of who you are in this world. Who you are are the little actions that you do on a regular basis, like giving up to 50 bucks for tzedakah, or saying good morning to your saying good morning to your spouse when you wake up and not snapping, or getting up on the bus for a little old lady. The little things that you do, the little things that you define who you are, not the big things that you do. The big thing you do, good, you get rewarded for it. I told you there's a story that I'm very fond of because I was on the bus when we had a bus driver. He used to drive to our neighborhood who had an annoying habit. He obviously was not happy with his job. And anybody, and I don't know if he wasn't happy with his job or he just, he just had a certain sadistic pleasure, especially with people with American accents. You know, he, there are three doors on the buses. Anybody who was by the back door, by the second or third door, he'd get to the stop and he just wouldn't open those doors. Until he said, Nahag, Nahag, Bivakasha, Hadelet, Bivakasha. And he had to yell to yell the bus driver to open the door. And eventually he went, now it's not that complicated because there are three buttons by the driver. And all you got to do is push all three. It's really not that tricky. And he would do this on a regular basis. So we all do this. Driver, on a regular basis, he tortured you. You had to beg to get off the bus. Okay, so I was once on the bus. This guy's driving towards my neighborhood. And uh, he suddenly he stops the bus right in the middle of Eshkol Avenue, heading towards, heading towards French Hill. He stops the bus, opens the door, gets up. A little old lady had fallen down on the sidewalk, and he got off the bus to help her up. He stopped the bus to get help her up. He helps this little old lady up, and he gets back on the bus strutting like a rooster. And you could read his mind as he gets on the bus like, does anybody realize what a, what a tzaddik I am? Uh, you can read it. It was written. It, he didn't have to say it. It, it was loud. It was loud and clear. Right? Now I want to tell you something. If you were walking on the sidewalk and had the opportunity, and you saw a little old lady lying there, would you help her up? Is anybody in this room? Well, you're not going to kick her. You're obviously going to help her up, right? He happened to have the opportunity because he was driving the bus, so he could stop the bus, open the door, and get off. That does not define you as a tzaddik. Now, he thought it did. You want to be a tzaddik? Open the door and stop torturing people. Right? Stop torture. Just push the buttons and open the door. That's who you really are. That's not who you are. That's a one-off exception. You'll get rewarded for it. You did a mitzvah. That's not who you are, though. That's, and, and we often feel that we, you know, certainly if we want to make up for lost time, like, I want to be a tzaddik. We're looking for big, dramatic things to do, and this is a lot of our Western indoctrination, that in all the cowboy movies, unless you shoot the bad guy, unless you shoot the bad guy, you haven't done anything significant in life. You, know, you gotta have a show, you have a showdown, and, and Marshall Dillon has to shoot the bad guy. Now, that's what you gotta do. You gotta be the hero who shoots the, the biggest hero in Judaism is don't get angry, control your mitos, 
Try not to be selfish. Control your ego. Give some tzedakah. Learn some Torah. That's who you really are. Once in a while, you get an opportunity to be a big one. You find a, you find a lot of money and you give it back. You find the thousands of dollars. This happens once in a while. Somebody finds you know a big, a big uh, mitzvah that somebody does because he found a pile of $10,000 and gave it back to somebody. That's great. That's great. Did you yell at your wife that morning? Did you yell at your wife that morning? Did, did, you, did you have an argument with your father that morning? That's who you really are. You'll get reward for the mitzvah, no question about it. And sometimes it's a big test. And you pass the test, it's terrific. But that doesn't define who you are. That doesn't define who you are. You're defined by the consistency. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying over here. I didn't take one donkey. Let's look at the little things. That's how we define a person's level. Not the, not the big things. The big things we have to do. But it's the little things that really defines the person. What were we going to ask, Ezra? Well, I was going to say... Ask, I, ask. Question or statement? Question well, or comment? I'll only take... It, it, limit it to comments. Limit to comments. Limit to questions, I mean. Yeah, li- I, I'm not sure if this is right or not. Go ahead. A Jewish question. Was the, it's a Jewish question. A Jewish question is a statement, and you just go, right? <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's called a Jewish question. No, it's <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Very, very yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Was, are you chayav to, to um, not reimburse the tzedakah? Like, is that, is that a... No, 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 so you're good to reimburse it, but it's a mistake, you now, gave it away. So now I'm starting to comment that if it is, then, then it would be that both of these things, they weren't high up to do in this sort of thing. Uh, Good, good, but it, it's a little thing, it's a something that, uh, it's not a me, yeah, listen, most people, I gave it away, all right, keep the money, big deal, you know, big deal. Yet, that's more of a definition of who you are than one big dramatic thing, that's what he's saying. Okay. <laughs> I've been, le- I've given, le- you know, sometimes in a lecture, I'll, uh, I'll say, okay, does anybody have any questions? You know, so a bunch of hands go up. I'll say, just limit it to questions and not comments. Three quarters of the hands go down. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. This is a lecture. This is a year. <laughs> but in lectures, one person can start talking and then they dry everybody out. So I've learned from experience. Not to yeah. comments, are, comments are tricky because I don't know what's being said, what's going to be said. Is it undermine what I said? Somebody quotes somebody, quote, misquotes. I, so I generally try to limit the to questions. Okay. Take a look. Take a look at um, the. Uh, uh, let's go on. Let's go on. And you take a look now on Pasuk Chaf Zion. Where is it? Twenty-seven. Tez Zion Chaf Zion. So uh, at the bottom of page eight twenty-four. Um, we'll pick it up seven lines from the bottom. Vaydaber Hashem al Moshe Lebar. Hashem says to Moshe, Daber al Ha'eda, seven lines from the bottom, 824. Speak to the people, hey, Alu Misaviv Lamishkan Korach Vidasan Vaviram. Everybody get away from the area of Korach, Dasan, and Aviram. Vayaka Moshe Vayelchal Dasan Vaviram. Moshe goes over to them. Vayelcho Achar Zikne, so the elders follow him. Vayadaber al Ha'eda Lemur. Now this is bad. Stay away from the, get away from the tents of these wicked people. Don't touch anything of theirs. Lest you get, uh, how's the, how do you, how do you, lest you perish, good word, because of their sins. Now, if I was Dustin of Avira Merkorach at this point, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu is now talking, these are, these are fight man's words. Now, they still have a chance to do tshuva. All they got to do is say, sorry, 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 we're wrong. Okay, we apologize. You still have a chance. You always do tshuva. Everybody gets away. And Avram came strutting out, standing confidently. No sign of any sort of submission. Their wives and their sons and their, and their children. Now listen to this line. This is right. I'm amused by this every time I see this. Vayomer Moshe. Moshe says, "Bezos teidun ki Hashem shlochani." Lasos is called my sabbat. I'm going to give you a sign, and this way you'll know you've challenged my entire mission. You're claiming that I did everything on my own and it was all my idea. I'm going to give you a sign that everything I've done is because Hashem sent me. Kilomi libi. It didn't come from my own heart. I didn't do it. You know why? If these guys die a regular death, if they all drop dead of heart attacks, Hashem hasn't sent me. 
But, if Hashem creates something, if the earth opens its mouth, and swallows them up, they go down alive into the depths, then you know that Hashem has been, they've provoked Hashem. You don't hear what, I mean, now if I was them, if I was them, I'd be really, really nervous at this point. Because Moshe Rabbeinu comes along and says, listen, if everybody here drops dead of a heart attack, my bad. Well, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. And if you get swallowed up alive, I'm right. Oh, oh. If I, I, mean, if I was them, I was like, oh, 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 right. Yeah, you understand what? Okay, so some of the commentaries say if they, die, if they die a regular death, if they lie in bed and they die a death later in the future. But there is an approach that says that they're, that they're what do you call it, that they're, 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 they're uh, 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 they'll drop dead on the spot. He's saying if you drop dead on the spot. So the, one of the, the, the Hassam Sofer says, I understand. Moshe Rabbeinu says, listen, if they die, then I'm wrong. If they die a regular death, I w- you're right, I made up the whole thing. So I don't understand. So then why should they die? Why should they die? Moshe says, well, if, I, you know, if they die a regular death, then, then, then they're right. And if they die a supernatural death over here, then they're wrong. But what he's saying is that even if they're right, they're going to die. Now why should they die? If they're right, why should they die? So you know what the Hassam Sofer says? They already have forfeited their lives. They already deserve to die. You know why? Because when there's a leader of a community, and this applies to all of us, and you have a rav of a shul or a rabbi of a community, you got a problem, don't start a rebellion. Nobody's perfect. The rabbi's going to make mistakes. Who said that if you disagree, you got to start and be a rabble rouser and start a rebellion? For that alone, undermining the authority, you deserve to die already. person deserves to die just for undermining the rabbi's authority because no matter what he's done wrong, this is going to make things worse. What do you want? There shouldn't be any rabbi? Korach says, nobody should be the leader. No, no, no leaders. So what are you going to end up with? Nobody's the leader? Communism. So you're going to end up with what you call communism. <laughs> they have a leader, boy. They have a leader. <laughs> you see what it leads to. Anarchy. Right? They, they, yeah, you're, you're absolute chaos and anarchy. So what happened? The rabbi made a mistake, so go talk to him. Go, to, go, go make an appointment and go talk to the rabbi. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu, listen, can we speak to you for a second? We don't understand all these appointments. How come, how come you overlooked me? How come you overlooked all these people? Well, you got to get everybody riled up and start a rebellion. For that alone, you deserve to die. And if you're wrong, that's if you're right. That's if you're right. That means, in, I told you many times, in life, you can be right and you're still wrong. And don't be right, be smart. I told you, if, you, if you're wrong and you give in, and you're smart. And if you're right and you give in, then you're married. Right? Right? So, so, you know, you know, so, so what's your right? So what? And just because you're right, so what? We always think we're right. We always think we're right. So it says, if that happens, okay, now watch. Moshe finishes speaking. The earth underneath them opens up. The earth opens its mouth. Vativla osam, it swallows them. Ve'es bateim, their houses. Ve'es kola adam asher lekorach. Ve'es kola rechush, all of the property. Now listen carefully. The earth opens its mouth. The Medrash says it wasn't a, an earthquake. It wasn't an earthquake. What happens when there's an earthquake? There's a crack. Mm-hmm. This wasn't a crack. A mouth formed <laughs> and swallowed them with the sound of a gulp. Remember 7 way. Remember 7 Eleven? Remember 7 Eleven used to have something called a big gulp? Yeah. Right? This was the original big gulp. This is the, big, this is the original big gulp. And right? And you hear the earth gulping them down. What bracha did the earth make? Bore Priha Adam. Right? You know, I, you know, I, I, so the earth, the earth gulps them down. Right? Live. Right? Swallows them alive. The whole bunch of them. Why? Why did Moshe Rabbeinu do this? Why did it have to be a mouth? So one of the explanations is, one of the explanations my son told me years ago, uh, uh, that, 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 that one of the ideas here is, well, you open your mouth. Hashem plays me to kick at me. You open your mouth. You open your mouth, you get swallowed by a mouth. Right? You get swallowed by a mouth. More than, okay. More than that. More than that. There's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avos that many of you have learned. The Mishnah says 
you should daven, listen to the wording of the Mishnah, daven for the welfare of the government. Daven that there should be a strong central government. Why? If not for the fear of the government, people would swallow each other up alive. That's the wording in Pirkei Avos. If not for some sort of law intimidation, people would swallow each other up alive. You don't believe me? Go to the south side of Chicago for a little while. Right? Then you'll see what it means to swallow each other up alive. What happens every time there's a blackout in the United States? Looting. Right? Looting. Lawlessness. People symbolically are swallowing each other up alive. Oh, Korach. What did you want? No one should be a leader. There should be nobody in charge. Then as Itamar said earlier, what do you get? Anarchy. That means people would swallow each other up alive. Oh, that's what you would have created. Therefore, the punishment for Korach is they get swallowed up alive. Everybody is swallowed up alive. Because that's what you would have caused if your idea would have come out. You would have caused a situation where people are swallowing each other up alive. Therefore, they get swallowed alive. Now, even more than that. The, uh, first of all, the Medrash says that when they started running, they, they, there's a noise and there was running, the cracks followed them around. You ever seen the cartoons? They used to have that sort of thing where the fist stretches out and follows, you know, the, the, the cracks are, are, are following them around and they're all falling into these cracks. Now, the Medrash says over here two things. Now, I want to get to a very, very important point here. First of all, the first point is it says it swallows up Korach ves Kola Rechush. All of his property was swallowed up. And the Medrash says not one needle belonging to Korach remained. Not even a needle. Which means after the earth, it is opened up, swallowed them up, and it closed up. They weren't left with this fault. Isn't that what it's called, a fault, when there's, a, when there's an earthquake and the crack is called a fault, isn't it? It opened up, swallowed them up, and there wasn't even a crack left. And they get swallowed up. There was no evidence whatsoever that a man named Korach was, as it was, ever, was ever alive. There's zero. No evidence whatsoever. There's no evidence whatsoever that a man named Korach was ever here. I always feel that way. I always think to myself, whenever I'm leaving a house where I've been hosted, I always feel my room should look when I leave that there is no evidence that I was ever there. When you leave somebody's house, there should be no evidence that you were ever there. Leave the room in a situation, in a state. I didn't say the table. On the table, some people leave no evidence at the table that they were ever there. You know, though they eat, they eat all the food. But I mean, the, the room there should be no, it should be clean, clean up your stuff, clean up a mess. There should be no evidence that the person was ever there. Same thing when you're in a base medrash, you've been sitting at a table, put the chair back, straighten out the table, put away the swarm that you used. There should be no evidence that you were ever there. Korach, there's no evidence. Now why is that? First of all, what happens if you're, there's, what mitzvah could you do unintentionally? There's one mitzvah in the Torah that you could only do unintentionally. One mitzvah. What is it? Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem you could do, definitely do intentionally. No, definitely I'm do intentionally. Dying for the sake of Dying for Kiddush Hashem is certainly intentional. You could, it, could, it could happen unintentionally, but it could happen intentionally. Uh, there's yeah, one mitzvah that could only be done without intention. What do you say, Mordechai? Excellent. Shikha. They're one of the things in the field. You've heard of, of, of peya. There's peya that you leave in the field. There's leket, which is the fallen grains. And there's one type of gift in the field that if you walk past, as you're harvesting your field and you walk past, I'm not going into the technical halachas now, but as you walk past the grain, a certain point when you're collecting it and you forgot to take certain bundles of the grain with you, you're not allowed to go back and take them. You have to leave them for the poor people. You could leave it there and make it hefker, but that's not shikha. That's just, that's just tzedakah. To fulfill the mitzvah of shikha, not shiksa, shikha. <laughs> to fulfill the mitzvah, to fulfill the mitzvah of shikha, the hurry, hurry, you got to forget about also. It's called shikha. Shikha means forgetting about her, forgetting the grain. That's also forget about her, right? But here we're talking about a mitzvah. You could only fulfill the mitzvah if you forgot it. And if you pretend to forget it, that's not shikha, that it's tzedakah, hefker, whatever you want to call it. That's the only way you can fulfill the mitzvah. Now, you forgot it, leave it, and it's for the poor people. What happens if you're walking along and you drop $10 out of your wallet and you didn't even know it? And a poor man finds the money, you get credit for tzedakah. How do you like that? 
you get credit for tzedakah. What? Wait, what's that? We learned that this morning. This morning. How do you like it? It's all one Torah. How do you like that? Sedna, the Gemara says, Sedna da Arachadu. The entire earth is one big clump. It means all of Torah is all one piece. It's all one piece. And you're going to see this happening all the time. You're going to learn something in the morning in a halacha shir. Then you're going to hear about it in a nach shir later in the afternoon, the next day in a gemara shir. It happens all the time. If you drop 10 bucks and a poor man finds it, so then you get credit for tzedakah. If a drug addict finds it, you don't. You don't. I, why did his guy get lucky and I didn't get lucky? It has to do with other merits that a person has. You have to have the merit. You also have to hang around in the wrong place, in the right places. So if you happen to drop 10 bucks around the tavern district in, somewhere in Scotland, chances are that it's going to be some alcoholic who's going to find it. If you hang around the streets of Mayasharim or B'nai Brock, chances are a poor man's going to find it. At the end of the day, you get credit for the mitzvah. We don't want the Torah's Hashem. We don't want Korach getting any credit at all. What happens, he's got a needle, and one of his needles is found by a poor man. Somebody uses it, or a Tabat Chacham then uses it. Korach gets credit for that. No more credit for Korach. No more credit for Korach. And he gets swallowed up alive. Do you know that we have a custom on, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, um, at, uh, at the end of Sukkot, no? What's it called? Shemini Atzeres. And you guys call it Simcha's Torah for the nine dayers. You know, when we dance with the Sefer Torah. And at a certain point during the Hakafos, they start jumping up and down. Moshe Emes with Torah. And everybody jumps up and down. They throw the kids up in the air. Yeah. Right? They, they say, okay. You know where that custom comes from? No. The Gemara says, the Gemara says that Rabbi Barbarachada was once traveling in a desert. And there was an Arab tour guide. And he said to him, come, I'll show you where Korach and his men have been swallowed up. And he shows them, special effects, he shows them a, what do you call it, he shows them a, a hole in the ground where there's smoke coming out of the hole. And so Rabbi Barbarachana took a spear and he put a clump of soaking wet wool on the edge of this spear and he stuck it into the ground and he pulled it out and was singed. That means it's kind of kind of it's kind of hot down there. And then he put his ear to the hole. I guess he was careful not to get it burnt. Put his ear to the hole, and he said, "This is where Korach and his buddies are buried. This is where they were swallowed up." And he put his ear to, and he heard them all yelling, "Moshe emes v'toraso emes." Wow. Moshe is true, and his and his Torah is true. So when we say that, we could assume that people who are on a hot floor are probably jumping up and down. That's where the tradition comes from. And therefore, when we say Moshe Emes with Torah so Emes, which is a quote from the Gemara, which is what Torah, Korach is, in his, in his, in his cohorts are saying down there, that's why we jump up and down to say Moshe Emes with Torah so Emes, to symbolize Korach and his men jumping up and down. I once read, you know how they train, they train bears to dance? They have one of these, one of these uh, circus shows. They bring out the bears and they play music and the bears start dancing. You know how they do that? How do you train, train bears to dance? Because they put the bear, I, I, this, I, why I know this, I don't know, but I don't remember where I got this from. I couldn't make it up on my own. What they do is they put the bears, they have a bed of hot coals. And they lead the bears onto this bed of hot coals. And the bears are jumping up and down. And while they're jumping up and down, they play music. So then when they bring them out to perform, they start playing the music, and that makes an association with the bears. So the bears start jumping up and down. So Korach and his men are jumping up and down, yelling Moshe Emes with Torah so Emes. That's why on, on, on Atzeris, we're jumping up and down, saying to Moshe Emes with Torah so Everybody's jumping up and down. Yeah? If there was no trace of Korach and his people getting swallowed up, then how could this person find... Excellent question. Excellent question. I don't know. I don't know. That's what the Gemara says. I don't know. It's a good question. Needs an needs analysis. Good question. At the end of the day, that's what the Gemara says. He showed him the holes where the smoke is coming up. He says, that's where it's a very good question. Don't know. Have a very intriguing question. If I have time, I'll try to look into it, but I don't know. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, now, there's another idea here, and this is essential. Why is it such a punishment? Why is it, why is this, the, okay, there's Mita Kineged Mita, and they swallow it up, and they would have created anarchy, and so on and so forth. And he opened his mouth. There's a deeper idea, a much deeper idea. Korach was suffering from this plague of envy. When you're, and again, this is a man who's got everything. A man who's got everything and feels he's got nothing. Like Haman. When you're jealous, 
so first of all, jealousy is unfair. Because when you're jealous of somebody, you're picking one isolated factor in the other person's life, which is unfair. You can't, you can't pick one isolated factor. It's either all or nothing. Michael Jordan said, Michael Jordan said that people all wonder, people say, I'd like to be Michael Jordan for a day. But it's not Michael Jordan for a day. It's always Michael Jordan. So he can never go shopping, and he can never do this, and he can't ever go anywhere without getting mobbed. And he got, now, I don't feel sorry in any way, shape, or form for Michael Jordan, right? Uh, he's the first sports billionaire, and uh, he's doing okay. And I, I, I'm not worried about Michael Jordan. <laughs> but what he's saying, there is a lot to what he's saying. There's truth to it. You're looking, I'd like to be Michael Jordan for a day, because then I could go back to being who I, no, it doesn't work that way. It's an all or nothing. So you see a guy, this guy's got, wow, he's got, you know, he's got a good life situation. He's got, he's got a nice car, and he's got a nice, what do you call it? He's got, a, he's got a nice house, he's got a nice car. Yeah, but do you know his father-in-law? All right, you sure you want that? You sure you want what this other guy's got? This guy's got a great job, and he's got a, just got a promotion. You want his promotion? Do you also want his wife? The kind of Gehenna he goes home to every night? You're sure that, you're sure, you don't know, you got the whole, you want his whole background, you want to go through what he's going through in life? If you looked at the, saw the whole picture, you say, no, 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 not, not that, <laughs> not that. I know his mother-in-law, forget it, you know, no, no way. A person can't look, we do that. We look at what another person has, we look at one thing that the other person's got. You know how hard he worked for it? Sure, I got a friend who's, got a friend who's making a nice salary, you know, a very nice salary. You know why? He's a doctor. Boy, I'd like that salary. Yeah, so why didn't you go to med school? Well, you know, <laughs> hey, not that much. Right? So I asked this guy once what his schedule was. In May. And I asked my friend, the doctor, what was the schedule in medical school? He told me he got up at 6.30 in the morning, he studied straight till 10.30 at night, took 20 minute break to play ping pong to let out his aggressions. You wanna do that for six years? Nope, nope, not even for 20 minutes, <laughs> right? No. So now you're jealous because he's making the money? You could have done that. You could have done that. You know, no. It was not, okay, so what, that's not fair. So jealousy, number one, is unreasonable. Number two, jealousy is actually being angry at God for how he's running his world. Right? That's what jealousy really is. I'm upset with Hashem, how he's running his world. Why does this guy have a nice car and I don't? Now I'm jealous. Now I'm jealous. Why does he have a nice voice and I don't? Why has he got artistic talent and I don't? Well, because you're a distributor, you have some talents. You have abilities. You've got, you've got good things in your life. So you're upset with the way God's distributing things. That's what jealousy really is. Because jealousy, if I'm jealous of the human being, that means I'm not happy the way God's distributing the goods. That's what jealousy really is. But what it means at a deeper level is you're so focused on the other person, you feel you don't even exist. I've got nothing. I, I, I'm just so focused. When, you, when a person is jealous, we're so consumed with the jealousy that we feel that we, we, we don't, we're not even here. We've lost our own essence. Oh, Korach, you feel you've got nothing. I'll show you what it is to have nothing. You feel that without being the Kohen Gadol, you don't exist. I can't, I'm not even alive if I'm not the Kohen Gadol. I don't exist. I, if it's not that, then I'm, I, 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 I'm nothing. Okay, so I'll show you what it is to not exist. And therefore, Mita can I get Mita, they get swallowed up. That's the way of showing you what it is. That's what you're at. You want, you're an ingrate, but I've given you wealth, and I've given you honor, and I've given you other good things. And one thing you don't have, and therefore you've got nothing. Now I'll show you what it is to have nothing. And therefore, Korach, Korach suffers the ultimate punishment, and Korach and his men get swallowed up. But Victor Miller says, now they're down there yelling, Moshe Emes Vitoroso Emes. One second earlier, had they said that, none of it would have happened. At the last minute, they could have just said, Moshe Emmons, Ross Emmons, we give up, surrender, you're right, retreat. You blew it. You blew it. You had one, one second, and you blew it. And therefore, Korach and his men suffer the eternal, what do you call it, of being sent down into Gehenim, and even more, because every time we read the Parsha, they suffer even more. Every time we read this, they suffer even more. When you read something about somebody in the Torah, so we're just reading it over here. Yeah, but their name's in the Torah. That's, that's eternal suffering for the Neshama. So 
what do you call it? The, the lesson is obviously be good. That's the lesson. Be good and don't be jealous. And don't start trouble. And don't start rebellions. That is the, the, the what do you call it? That's the, that's the lesson. Get, and you don't get upset.